In this video, I will share with you my advice regarding each section of the anesthesia primary exam. Most of this discussion will be about the short answer questions, since that is where marks are there to be won or lost as a result of your strategy. Elsewhere, in my opinion, it matters less. I have only two pieces of advice regarding the multi-choice questions. The first is that it's not worth devoting too much time to them. It's only a hurdle requirement, meaning that beyond passing or failing, it does not contribute to your final score. The reason it is that way is because we all got rather good at remembering and distributing past MCQs. The questions are written in such a way that if you have learnt sufficient content, then you will pass without too much difficulty. Once I found out it was a hurdle, I didn't study for the MCQs at all. The second piece of advice I would give you is that you should beware the question that appears to be a repeat. The examiners may change the stem subtly to trip up those who don't understand the concept being tested and are instead relying on their ability to recall the answers to past questions. In that sense, it might even be better not to have studied for the primary exam MCQs. The SAQs, as I said, are a different beast because you will be assessed not just on your knowledge, but on your ability to integrate pieces of information from disparate areas and in some cases on your ability to apply them to clinical medicine. I must say that I'm ambivalent about this departure because on the one hand, the ability to integrate what we know is the essence of medicine and it certainly makes for a much more interesting viva. But on the other hand, if the line between the part one and the part two exams continues to be blurred, then at some point there won't be any knowledge worth integrating. My sense is that at the present time we are getting it about right, but I don't expect it will stay that way for long. Although having said that, maybe this will become a moot point altogether once artificial intelligence really gets up and running in our field. Part of the reason I uploaded my SAQ answers online is that there is no good source for such things for this integration process. There are several outstanding physiology textbooks, but none of them is much help to you when you're trying to write a 10 minute answer for a question spanning cardiovascular physiology, respiratory physiology, exercise physiology, and the physiology of aging. And yes, such a question does exist. Here's another way of demonstrating what they want from us in the SAQ answers. On the primary daily learning outcome website, one of the examiners has written an amusing yet informative translation of each of the questions for 2019B's paper. What you can see is that they are trying to make a point when they write the question, and it is usually a very basic or important point. Therefore, my strategy was to include a short introductory paragraph during which I would demonstrate that I get the point. Here is my answer to the question on the cardiovascular effects of neuraxial blockade. If I had my time again, then I would probably remove the section on mechanism of action because it adds very little. Instead, the important things to get across are, what does a spinal do to the heart and blood vessels? And why does that matter to the anaesthetist? I want to point out here as well that I would not use tables in the exam, except in certain compare and contrast type questions. The reason I wrote my own model answers using tables is that it forced me to be more organised and concise as I, as I wrote them. Here is another example of an introduction. The question here is what are the cardiovascular effects of intermittent positive pressure ventilation? Again, the important things to get across are a. What is the upshot of the effect of IPPV on the heart and the blood vessels? And b. In what circumstances does that become particularly important? Honestly, I have no idea whether this approach in terms of the introductory paragraph is something that the examiners liked. But to my mind, a punchy paragraph at the beginning helps to convey your understanding very quickly and it helps establish a hierarchy within the facts that we, that we are otherwise just spewing onto the page with little indication as to their relative importance. Having emphasized the importance of the introductory paragraph, I would also add that it is sometimes unnecessary such as with this question on the wash-in curve. In general, I would avoid simply defining the terms of the question unless it is specifically requested that you do so. The examiners have made it clear in recent years that unnecessary definitions will not earn any marks. 
Regarding the body of your answer, I would say that there needs to be a structure. Unfortunately, I cannot recommend a one-size-fits-all approach. However, there are recurring themes with respect to structure, and there were probably not more than 10 distinct ways in which I formulated my answers. I recommend you write in dot points rather than in sentences, since this will be easier on your forearm and more importantly, easier on the examiner's eyes. I would also recommend that you draw diagrams, but only when it's clearly necessary. For example, in a question on the loop of Henley. Often the examiner will make this clear to you through the formulation of the question. Whatever the case, avoid doubling up. That is, if you feel the need to write an explanation as well as draw the diagram, then it might not be worth drawing the diagram at all. For some questions, the strategy will be immediately apparent. For others, it is something that it will take you time to figure out. This is why I argue it's important to prepare for the SAQs specifically. We will now go through some examples. For questions of blood flow regulation, I would generally include some introductory information on the circulation in question, including the flow rates, the anatomy, and the application of Ohm's law. Then I would go through the determinants by their physiological category. This includes the pressure on the arterial side of the organ, the pressure on the venous side of the organ, and the determinants of vascular resistance at that organ, namely the myogenic, chemical, hormonal, rheologic, and local processes. For questions about renal substance handling, it is simply filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. This here is my summary of the renal handling of potassium. Questions about acid-base homeostasis are best answered in terms of the components of the body's response to an acid-base disturbance. That is, dilution, buffering, respiratory and or renal compensation, ion exchange, and the correction of the underlying cause. If there is a question on a whole body pathology like sepsis or hemorrhage, or if there is a question on a whole body response to a physiological actor like insulin, then I would suggest having a section on the global response, including autonomics, fluid and electrolytes, hormones and substrate mobilization, and then a section on the specific effects on organ systems, that is the heart and the blood vessels, the lungs, the kidney, the blood, the gut, and so on. Clearly there is some overlap between these two sections, but this was the best I could come up with. If there is a question which can be defined by a single equation, then it is best to answer that question in terms of the components of the equation. Here we see a question on the determinants of the partial pressure of CO2 in arterial blood. The basis of this is of course the alveolar ventilation equation. Therefore, there is a section on the determinants of the rate of CO2 production and on the determinants of the rate of alveolar ventilation and some small section on those factors affecting the relationship between the CO2 content and the CO2 partial pressure. If there is a question regarding the effect of a particular perturbation on a physiological system, I would suggest first discussing the direct effects, then the compensatory response, and then the maladaptive response if relevant. This example here is a question on the effect of sevoflurane on the body's response to hemorrhage. This is also an excellent example of an examiner trying to make a point, meaning that you have to give him or her what he or she wants in the introductory paragraph. That's to say, sevoflurane impairs almost every aspect of the response to hemorrhage. Therefore, if a patient in hemorrhagic shock is anesthetized without resuscitation, assuming you have time to do so, it is likely that decompensation and death will follow. If you yourself come up with a good structure for a difficult question, then for goodness sake, share it with your colleagues. Here I give you the example of perfusion limited versus diffusion limited gas transfer, a topic loved by physiologists and examiners alike. I would say that this question boils down to three things, the rate of transfer, the capacity for uptake, and the speed of transit. That's it. What this means is that anybody can pump out a 5 out of 5 answer to this question in just a few minutes. Therefore, if you come up with good structures, then I encourage you to send them to Frank's son. 
For pharmacology questions on an individual drug, the physicochemical, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic classification system reigns supreme. Questions on the rate of drug offset are difficult to answer, whether it is an inhaled or an intravenously administered drug. The best I can come up with is this. First, have a section on how much drug is there, which is to ask what concentration is in the plasma and to what extent has uptake occurred. Second, have a section on the rate of removal in the central compartment. Technically, there ought to be a section on the rate of removal from the effect site as well, but I found that this didn't add very much to my answer. And third, have a section detailing how much needs to be removed for the effect to disappear. For example, what are the determinants of MACA wake? Note that this type of question is distinct from a washout question. In a washout question, we are not concerned with the drug concentration associated with the offset of effect. Likewise, for inhalational anesthetics, pay attention to the wording of the question. Wash in, onset and uptake are not the same thing. For equipment questions, my structure would often be A. What is it made of? B. How does it work? And C. In what circumstances might the device be inaccurate? One last thing about the SAQs. In the month leading up to the written exam, focus your attention on the questions that have been recently asked, say the past two years, and poorly answered, say less than 30% pass rate. It is highly likely that these questions will be repeated in your sitting, and if you can pump out three or four good answers, then you are well on your way to passing. To pass the vivas, all you really need to do is learn the content and show up on the day. Unlike in the SAQs, examiners will be able to redirect you if you are going down the wrong path. If you have the opportunity to attend an exam course where you will be subject to high fidelity practice vivas, then I suggest you take it. I was fortunate to attend an excellent course at the Waikato Hospital in Hamilton, New Zealand. I have four tips in regards to how you answer your questions in the vivas. The first is to pause for a few seconds before you start your answer so that you can speak in a formed sentence. The second is to go straight for the money so that the examiner knows that you get the point of the question. If you do this, you'll hear a sigh of relief and that will help you feel better too. The third tip is to provide a structure within your answer whenever it's possible. The answer to the question, why is ketamine used so often as an analgesic, should begin with, there are physicochemical, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic reasons. With respect to its physicochemical properties, ketamine is cheap, it has a long shelf life, blah blah blah. If you answer the question this way, you will often be ushered through the follow-on questions, gathering many marks as you go. On the other hand, if you answer the question out of order, it may take much longer for the examiner to be satisfied that you are able to flesh out a complete answer. The fourth tip is to draw graphs and diagrams whenever, whenever it is relevant, and often it is relevant, but you need to be able to describe what you're drawing at the same time. It will sound something like, on the x-axis we have time in minutes, on the y-axis we have Fa on Fi with a scale from 0 to 1, and the curve for nitrous oxide looks like this with a sharp elbow there. It takes practice to be able to do both at the same time, therefore I recommend you schedule a couple of sessions with your study group in the lead up to the viva, where you do nothing but review the common graphs and diagrams, and draw them for each other. My last tip for the viva preparation is to give yourself some time off after the written exam. I intended to take a week off, but I felt sufficiently depleted after the written to extend that period to a fortnight. Once again, listening to that little voice in my head paid off. And that is the sum total of my primary exam wisdom. I wish you all the very best for your preparation. Feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you.